Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for Direct Connection. We begin tonight with our Your Health segment and a focus on mental health in men. Joining us are Dr. William Reganold, Associate Professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Director of Geriatric Psychiatry at the uh, University of Maryland Medical Center. Also, Donna Jacobs, Senior Vice President of Government Regulatory Affairs and Community Health at the University of Maryland Medical System. Thanks uh, so much to both of you for being with us. Thank You're you. welcome. Pleasure to be here. Are, are these issues in men, we're talking about mental health in men, we don't like talking about that because we don't like talking about anything? Oh, uh, men, yeah, well, yes, especially maybe things that make us look weak, I think. Yeah, that is, that is an issue. I think men in general are underserved when it comes to getting help for mental illness. And a lot of it has to do with uh, the culture of masculinity and fear of looking weak, uh, fear of asking for help, and sort of the shame involved with that. So, Ms. Oh, Jacobs, you have an event coming up at the end of the month. We do. On November 28th, we have an event. Uh, the topic is called Not All Wounds Are Visible, and it's part of a series that we've been conducting on mental health and substance abuse. This particular one, while there's something for everyone, will focus on men and seniors, and we'll discuss particularly the issues of depression and anxiety. You're keynote speaker for this event is former uh, Baltimore Ravens great Jamal Lewis, who joins us on the telephone now. Uh, Mr. Lewis, thank you for being with us. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. It's very cool to talk to you, and everybody remembers you as a, a, a key part of the, the Ravens' first uh, Super Bowl win, and, and maybe would be surprised that, that you're giving a talk on this topic. What, what is your message? Um, basically that, you know, just in, in men in general, general, and, you know, being a football player and growing up, you know, since I was eight years old playing the game, um, I think the biggest thing is you always have to be this macho man and this person. And there's a lot of things that go on in um, an athlete, you know, and everybody, but, but in my case as an athlete, that goes on in your life that you reflect on and that, that it weigh you down from the community. Uh, that I was I was brought up in to you know just my venturing on into sports and and working my way out of my neighborhood and going on to be successful and also deal with the pressures and everything that comes along with that and you know keeping your job trying to stay healthy um, trying to, to to save money and take care of your family and things of that nature and you know being you know uh, going through concussion. Uh, issues within the NFL and really how it all brought back everything uh, to the forefront in, you know, my upbringing and um, depression. And, and I never really thought about it or even, you know, looked into it. But at the same time, when I was in this state uh, of, you know, my concussion protocol, my concussion, um, you know, syndrome, that I actually had when I got knocked out in a game, which was my final game I ever played, uh, everything just came came forward. And um, I was, you know, forced to go talk to somebody, and it, it just really helped me overcome and get through, um, you know, the, the mental issues and the depression issues that I was having. Can, and me, can I, I ask, to, back. were you, as, uh, as a star athlete, reluctant to go talk to somebody? I'm thinking, you know, we, we've just been talking about a lot of men don't like to talk about this stuff. Um, but at the same time, with your, your experience as, as an athlete, uh, you had all sorts of injuries, physical injuries, that you would get help for. Did, did you see this as being any different? Uh, it was different. It was a lot different. And that's, that's what I was getting into. It. it was much different when you have to talk to somebody and you can let off those emotions and you feel comfortable talking to that person, it kind of helped deal with the issues. But yes. at the same time beforehand, I wouldn't go and talk to anybody about it like if I had an injury. And that's the difference. And I think that's what we're talking about. And, and then it's this macho uh, front that you have to put on. But at the same time, you deal with so much that you keep in that you need to let out. One of the tough things for you, I, I, I saw a quote, uh, that you gave one interviewer was just the idea that the cheering stopped. And I guess that happens in everybody's life a, a little bit as you get older. But in your life, you know, literally people stopped cheering for you and that, that, that changed you a bit. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, I was talking about this with somebody else the other day. When you go out and you 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 got a football game and you have seventy five thousand people that are cheering for you and rooting you on and you know, you get ready to break through there on that, that, that long run and the crowd starts to stand up and just the energy from that and to go completely silent, you know, after the game and have to face regular civilian life and adapt to that, it's totally different when you have to go out and, and, and structure your own life and do things different, and you don't have that great applause or that crowd that's backing you when you, you're trying to go in with your, your job and go sell, you know? So you don't have that, and it's something that you're used to. Great uh, Raven star Jamal Lewis joining us on the phone, uh, keynoting this event coming up. We'll have more information for people on that. But, sir, we just want to thank you for your time, let you know that everybody around these parts is still cheering for you, and uh, we look forward to your speech. Jamal Lewis, thank you very much. Hey, I appreciate it. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, sir. Um, so, these issues different in men than, than women? Yeah, they are different. You know, I think uh, a lot of people suffer with depression and anxiety. Uh, about uh, one in five people will suffer depression in their lifetime. About one in three people will suffer an anxiety disorder. But the, the rates of diagnosis in women are about twice that of men. Uh, and there are probably a lot of reasons for that. And, and one is the under-recognition uh, and the, and the uh, and men's reluctance to ask for help. But I think also the way we um, screen for depression is an issue as well. Sometimes what we often see as a typical depression is not sometimes the way some men express it. So men may, may express it more with anger, or rage, uh, substance use, lots of irritability, more so than women, uh, who may express it a little bit more traditionally with sadness, tearfulness. And so it, sometimes it's under-recognized not only by the men themselves, but the people who, who might uh, pick it up, family members around them, health professionals. And Donna, listening to, uh, to Jamal, which was great, uh, just a terrific advertisement for the event, which, which is free. The event is absolutely free, and it, we call it a community conversation. It really is for the layperson to be able to come and talk to professionals about the issues that they or family members may be having. One of the things he said was, finding yourself alone. And we have learned through this series that our participants, people who come as audience members, get the most out of the discussions from people who've gone through the experience that we're talking about. And so this time, in addition to Jamal Lewis, we also have four other men who thankfully have come forward and want to share their stories about their bouts with depression, anxiety, and then their road to recovery. And they're everyday lay people. One is a writer, one is an attorney, one is a school administrator and another one uh, works in communications. But they want to talk about their reluctance at first to step forward and say, I think there's something wrong, but the relief that they've gotten once they've said, yes, I need some help and have moved forward. Let me remind our viewers, if you have a question about mental health in men or women, I suppose, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also email us a question. The email address is livequestions at mpt.org. Well, why does the medical system do these events? You're, you're a busy place. We are, but there are a lot of people that we see coming through the doors, coming through the emergency room, or even on an inpatient basis, who have an overlay of depression or some other form of mental um, uh, illness, which impacts their ability to take care of the chronic disease or the other issue that they may be coming to see us for. Uh, we've done some analyses in various communities, and we see a much higher prevalence of people who have a somatic disease, something that's physically uh, an ailment, but also have an overlay of a mental uh, illness that they need are, help with. Are, are these, is there any data to support that, that our part of the country, our part of the state has, has a bigger problem with these issues? Baltimore is a city. Yeah, not, I don't think so. Um, you know, if, if you look it's universal. at... universal. Yeah, it's universal. There are some, you know, there's some interesting patterns. I mean, there's, there's been an increase in suicide, uh, fairly dramatic, 30% 30, 30 over the past uh, 16 years or so. Uh, that's happened in Maryland as well. Um, and yet Maryland does not have one of the highest suicide rates. 
in, in the country. Um, Part of it, there, there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, one reason perhaps is um, gun control laws, for instance. Uh, very high percentage of suicides, over half, are due to guns. And a lot of states with very lax gun control laws, unfortunately, have higher suicide rates. Uh, well, well, so that's a major factor. But, but um, guns have been available you know, for a long time in a lot of ways in this country. Yeah. What, what would account for, for this getting worse? You know, that's a good question. Probably a lot of factors. You know, I don't think anybody knows the answer. But, you know, over the years, I think there's been a decline in a lot of protective factors. So increased divorce rates, uh, people becoming less religious in a communal sense, less tied to to their faith in, in, as a way of getting together with other people. So more, more social isolation, I think, okay. that is a factor that I think everybody pretty much agrees on. I can't say that's the factor, however. Let's take a phone call. Anne Arundel County, this is Steve. Steve, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yeah, we talk about anxiety. We talk about depression. Uh, I've, I've suffered some with bipolar. And I would say that uh, the biggest problem to find is to recognize that as a man, but even a woman, and the biggest problem is to find a qualified uh, doctor that can, uh, you know, help you overcome that. I think it's a real big problem. There's not enough out there. And luckily, I found a good doctor in Annapolis. And I won't mention his name unless you want me to. But uh, I think that's a big problem is finding the right qualified person that can help you through medication and things of that nature. Steve, help I, you get through it and live a normal life. Sir, that was a great phone call and great point. We very much appreciate it. How, how do you find the right person? Yeah, I think he's right. It can be difficult. Um, there is a shortage, shortage of mental health professionals. I think, you know, going to your primary care doctor and getting uh, perhaps treatment there first because it's accessible and if you need to be referred on, perhaps through your primary care doctor. Um, but finding the, a person that you connect with, that you trust, can be challenging. I'm glad this caller was able to do that. On, on a system-wide level, the, the number, the amount of need, the number of patients who need help versus the number of practitioners and the amount of time they have. On a statewide level, it's an issue, as Dr. Reginald says. Um, across our system, we have uh, some of the hospitals that have more mental health professionals than others, certainly the University of Maryland Medical Center would have more being the largest and being an academic um, medical uh, facility. But we also have physicians up in Harford County, uh, Baltimore, Washington Medical Center that provide professionals on a regular basis. But the point about seeing your primary care physician first is critical. And we also need primary care physicians to have a bit of knowledge about mental health and mental illness. Let's take a phone call. Uh, Baltimore County, this is Greg. Thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. I was listening to the previous caller, and I echo his comments. It's very hard to find a good talk therapist. I've been a stay-at-home dad for over 20 years. I left my career to take care of my autistic son. Wow. And um, it's, it, it, it's, it's challenging as a man because when I first did it, you know, there's all these there's all these groups for mommies and little kids, and when I started doing it, you know, I didn't quite fit in. And then um, I've noticed, too, with support groups, you know, it, it's funny. They mostly meet in the evening and stuff. And when you have a disabled kid, you, it's very hard to get that group support. And so I didn't know, like, I've, I've looked for support groups during the day, and it's very hard to find. So I don't know, you know, and I've even searched churches for, you know, different kinds of Bible studies and things, but they're all in the evening. So... I, I don't know if you addressed that or ever thought of that. Most of them seem to be for women, and, you know, I just didn't know if that mattered yeah. or not. Great, great points. Greg, uh, glad you called. Thank you very much. Th thoughts on availability of, of uh, talk therapy broadly and, and groups in particular? It was interesting because the first caller mentioned medical therapy, right. finding the, the right drug. Right. This gentleman uh, sees value in, in talk therapy. Yeah. You see both. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the combination, depending on what, what, what you need, uh, some people can do fine with simply talk therapy. Other people need medication and many people need both. Um, 
you know, finding a talk therapist can be tricky. Um, a lot of insurances don't pay for it, for instance. Many times you have to pay out of pocket. Uh, so it's challenging for people. Um, and then if you live in a remote area, especially, it can be very challenging. Uh, lately, our department's got into telepsychiatry as a way of trying to reach out to some of the rural areas in Maryland. Um, but, uh, you know, finding the right group, I, I sympathize with him. I'm, I'm sure that it is difficult to find groups that, that fit his needs. Here's yeah. a tough question. If uh this time of year, families are, are together more, and if, if somebody sees troubling signs, and it could be a friend, could be a family member, uh, what do you do? I mean, how do you intervene you safely, effectively, in, in what way? What have you seen that's successful? I mean, it really depends on uh, how urgent it is. You know, obviously, if you think somebody is, you know, a, a, a sort of an immediate danger to themselves or other people, then calling 911, uh, you know, getting the police involved. But if it's something not that urgent, then it's a matter of trying to, you know, gain their confidence and their trust so that they can listen to you and take your advice. Um, and um, that's that's very important. Um, you know, you you kind of have to get an, get a sense for what they're going through in their in, in their own words and try to interpret it in a way that you know can help them. Um, sometimes that means you know referring them to a therapist. Uh, sometimes it means escorting them to an emergency room. Um, you know, and sometimes it means refer to to a mental health professional. You know, it really depends on on the individual and what they're presenting. And we talked earlier about the yeah. resistance that men may have to, to, uh, to sure. open up, yeah. to let anyone see any, any dents in the armor. Well, I, I'm heartened by the fact that the first two calls already have been from men. That's yeah. good, but you're, you're right. Men are taught not to lean into their feelings and do, certainly do not want to succumb to the stigma associated with mental illness, would rather keep quiet about what they may be in experience, silence. suffer in yeah. silence. Uh, Anne Arundel County, this is George. George, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm curious to know whether, since there is a, uh, established here a center for men, is that because um, the genders have different problems, uh, or is it more that the approach of the treatment is different? Thanks very much. And it's not a particular institution focused on men. It's an event. It's an event. Right. It's a conversation that day with professionals talking about various aspects of depression and anxiety, focusing on men, and the participants that I mentioned, speakers who are coming to talk about their particular experiences. So it's a, this is a one-day event in a series of many with that focus. How, how do you uh, help people at this event who are gonna want some sort of follow-up? You're gonna we, have a bunch of people who are gonna want appointments or, or something yes, further. You're absolutely right, it's a, it's a great question. So there are, um, there's great opportunity built into each session for questions to be asked and answered. In addition, we have vendors. So I should say the main event is downtown in Baltimore across from the University of Maryland Medical Center. Right. But we're also live streaming to other, others of our locations across the state. We also at the medical center and, and other locations will have vendors who provide direct services available to be able to talk to people and address their needs so that you can get some follow up immediately. I do love the idea. As you said, we had a couple of callers who are, have dealt with issues and are doing well. Uh, yeah. So I want to end this in a, on a brief note of, of optimism. What would you say? Well, what I'd say is that anxiety and depression are very treatable. You know, obviously you have to ask for help to get treatment, but a lot of people succeed in, in uh, living more fulfilled lives getting treatment. And the caller brought up an interesting point. He thought we had a center for men's mental health. In fact, we don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of a center for right. men's mental health. There are centers for women's mental health out there. It's interesting. And, yeah, and maybe I think- an opportunity. Yeah, we maybe we an do opportunity. have to leave it there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Reginald, Ms. Jacobs, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.